Good morning. God is good. And all the time. All right. Uh, I did this last time, do it again this week. Uh, that song, you know, sometimes we sing them and they just come out because we've sung them so many times. But look, listen to those words. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. No merit of my own, his anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. And now for me he stands before the Father's throne and shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. His grace has planned it all. Tis mine but to believe and recognize his work of love in Christ receive. For me, he died. For me, he lives an everlasting life and light he freely gives. Well, that's the gospel right there, isn't it? And then sing it. Uh, we need to... Uh, oh, oh, wow. Okay, I'll stop. Um, <clears throat> we, what's that? Okay. <laughs> and we can take rest in that. And uh, some of us got some rest last week. Pastor Mike and Marilyn are home, back, and we had a week off last week, and uh, Mark Smith and Kim and Kathy and I got away last week for a few days, and that was good. Mark is not here today, he's quarantining, he's got surgery this next week, and so he had to go get tested, and then he has to quarantine himself, and, and, and uh, so that he's clean for surgery, so we can pray for Mark Smith this week in surgery. But uh, it was good to get away and rest. And last time I spoke to you, I, we, or the last time we were here, uh, we talked about the news and things that can get you down. And so, you know, when the news steals your joy, your eyes are in the wrong place. We've got our, we've got our eyes on Jesus. We read our words and we remember our hope is in the Lord. And uh, we keep our eyes on Jesus and the news can't steal your joy. Okay, uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, there, I'm not going to go through the bulletin completely. I'm going to highlight a couple things. I'm going to add a couple things to it. Um, but but uh, we're going to talk about four different missions that we support. And uh, one of them, uh, there's a big flyer in your bulletin there about the shoe boxes. And uh, normally, I, I, I'm i really bad at this. I see a flyer and I see where it's from. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I just I don't need to read that because I support that. So, but uh, I'm going to read the story. I mean, you all have it. You can read it. But I'm going to read it to you because I want to. So, and I have the microphone. So, uh, dear friend, since 1993, Samaritan's Purse has collected more than 168 million shoe boxes, packed with toys and other fun items by people like you, and delivered them to boys and girls in need around the world in partnership with local churches. Sam Pill, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, Sam Pyle, Sam Pill, who, who has cerebral palsy, received one of these shoebox gifts. Volunteers in his hometown of mm -hmm, Mongolia uh, hosted an Operation Christmas Child Outreach event for disabled children like him, but he was sick that day. Not wanting him to miss out, a volunteer simply or, or visited Sam Pell's home house to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him and give him a gift-filled shoebox. Sam Hill was delighted to find, among other uh, fun items, a towel, a toothbrush, and various school supplies inside. And this is a quote from him. After I got a shoebox, I became a Christian, and my relationships with others changed, Sam Pell said. He hadn't been to school in years, but the notebooks and the gift inspired him to enroll in a school for the disabled where he made many friends. Aware of Christ's forgiveness for his sins, Sam Pyle also forgave his father, who had left his family more than 10 years ago. Today, Sam Pyle has since graduated and serves as an assistant teacher at camp. Many boys and girls who receive shoebox gifts also enroll in the greatest journey, our 12-lesson follow-up discipleship program where they learn to follow Christ and share him with others. Millions of boys and girls have participated in this dynamic course so far. Would you consider joining us in spreading good news and great joy this year by packing the shoebox? Franklin White Graham. 
President Samaritan's Purse. So it's amazing what a shoebox can do. And we're called to spread the gospel. And this is a very simple and easy way to do that. So um, that starts. And there's information in the foyer. You can help yourself. And uh, the due date is uh, November 22nd. We'll collect those and get those shipped. Um, along with that, uh, we have a, a visitor today. Phil Schultz is here. Did I say that? Schultz? Shoot. Schultz. Okay. Phil is a new director of Wenatchee Rescue Mission, formerly Hospitality Ministries. And uh, so he's, he's here to see who we are. And, uh, and he said, thank you. Uh, that is one of the missions that we support monthly out of our missions budget as, uh, for Mid Valley Baptist Church. And so Phil, glad you're here today. Um, in our bulletin, uh, we have a note, our mission to pray for today. We always have a mission to pray for in the bulletin uh, weekly, and this one is Campus Meadows Bible Camp. I haven't talked to them directly or heard direct news, but I know that they're hurting. Uh, COVID, kind of hard to have campers when there's COVID, so that's a huge portion of their revenue. We also give them a monthly gift out of our missions budget. It's, those kinds of gifts are probably what's keeping them alive, and so uh, financially. Um, we can pray for them, we can support them financially, uh, and they have ministered to many of us, and many of our children, greatly. We need to uphold them in prayer. Um, another one, um, David Moore's boss is in Nigeria and with FFICM, and he's contracted COVID, and so now he can't travel, and it's not known when he'll get to come home. So we need to uplift him for his own uh, physical well-being, his recovery, and his, uh, the ability to come home. Okay, and as we see, once somebody gets it, it seems to just travel really fast. So we need to pray for um, their their efforts there and their ability to heal and move about. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple of couple of specific prayer requests here at home and some thank yous. Um, uh, praise God for Donna's continued recovery from head injury in the accident three months ago. She's doing quite well and continuing to recover. So I want to praise God for that. And then uh, Gene Hendrickson has lost a grandson this week uh, in the auto accident in Mississippi. But she wanted to uh, thank you uh, specifically for the help she's received at her home, uh, new steps put in, getting prepped for winter. And so she's very grateful and wanted, to, wanted you to know that she's very thankful. Thank you so much. Uh, so guys, we're doing a, you're doing a great thing ministering to Nora Jean there. Um, Another prayer request, I got a call uh, Friday, and so the bulletin had already gone to print, and then so the prayer list, but um, uh, Jeff and Ray, uh, Jeff and Ray were here. Um, their son, um, Blaine, uh, and Allie, his wife, they live in Spokane, and they received word this week that um, Allie's mother, Maria, is advanced stage four cancer, and they pretty much sent her home. There's nothing they can do for her. So it's a pretty shocking blow, and we, we wanted to add that to the prayer chain this week, uh, if we could, please. And so we need to uphold Blaine and Allie. And Allie came home this weekend uh, to be with her mother, Maria, and we need to uh, pray for Blaine and Allie and Maria and her family. Uh, okay, wow, that was a lot. I think, uh, and there's others too, I didn't get to all of them. Um, you know, the Siler family uh, continues to recover from a uh, Shocking blow to, uh, with the death of uh, um, Makayla. Uh, they're home now. The girls are uh, home in Ohio anyway. So you can either hold them up in prayer too. Um, whew. Is it good to be in God's house with God's people? It is. Uh, let's pray and ask God's blessing on all of these things. We'll give them to Him and trust Him for them. And we'll continue with our service. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you saw fit to redeem us in spite of ourselves. Uh, you have not changed. You are the same in the very beginning when you created all things and all things were good, as you are today and you will be tomorrow. Man made a choice and that's what changed things. But you are the same loving God full of mercy and grace, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And yes, you are righteous and just, and 
will have the final word and judge evil accordingly. But until then, you have given the opportunity to be redeemed by the name of your son Jesus Christ, because he was willing to die on the cross, rose on the third day, giving us forgiveness of sin and life eternal. And that is why we are here to glorify you and honor you and praise you in our song and our prayer and our reading of your scripture this morning, Lord. So we thank you for this opportunity to gather as brothers and sisters, made a family by your will through your son Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who continues to guide us and direct us and uh, minister to us, revealing your scripture and your will, uh, your will through our, your scripture to us. And uh, we, add, we thank you for this time this morning set aside. We thank you for Pastor Mike, his willingness and his desire and his dedication to deliver your word, to minister to each one here. We ask that your Holy Spirit would use him greatly this morning to uh, deliver a message as each one has needed. Silence all the distractions from our minds, the confusion, the, the news, the other things that would, that would distract us from focusing on you this morning. But we want to give these things to you. We want to pray especially for our missions, for Chemist Meadows, for um, um, it's now Wenatchee Rescue Mission um, as they, as they uh, struggle and strive and battle daily to serve you and minister to others. And for uh, the FFICM, the <clears throat> members in Nigeria who are ill, that you would heal them and that they would be free to travel and move about and carry out your word. Um, we want to also pray beforehand that you would bless the shoe boxes that are packed and delivered and that the gospel message would ring so true and that more lives would be changed and brought to your kingdom. Um, we want to thank you for the helping hands that have ministered to Norma Jean. We want to uphold her family and the loss of her grandson in Mississippi. We want to uphold the, the, the Siler family as they have uh, lost someone, their, his wife suddenly. Uh, wow. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Lord. Because when we keep our eyes on you, we have hope, we have joy, regardless of our circumstances. We do want to pray for our nation and uphold those, uh, our leaders, and that we would pray they would be seeking you, and those who are standing firm in truth, and uh, that you would give them courage and perseverance and strength to do so. We would pray for our elections, and, and that we would vote, and uh, that our voice uh, would be heard, and we have an opportunity to say our voice and our vote. Father, you have uh, given us freedom here in this country. Help us to be responsible with it. Father, we just, we just rest in you, knowing that you are our God, and that you are in control, regardless of our circumstances, our future is secure in you, uh, and our hope is not in fantasy, but in reality of what we know is to come. We praise you and thank you for your love for us. We want to give this time to you in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, 
hills to the highest place. I raise no hills and changing graves. In every heart and story game, I make the world to me a grave. I make the world to me a grave. Justice has been satisfied. 
when I got up here to say a few words before everybody started the message because they wanted to make sure I didn't Is that better back then? Thank you. That scared me for a minute. Um, last time I was, well, this, first of all, this last week when we were gone, I appreciated Brian Ross, one of our former pastors, to come and share the, a message with you all, and I heard that he brought some encouraging words as opposed to what I do from the book of Revelation and the survey on the tribulation. So thank you, Brian, for doing that for us. I appreciate it. The last time I was with you, uh, we had all of our first responders not stand up and be noticed, but we did want to pray for them, and we still appreciate our fire service and our law enforcement personnel who serve us in this great way and much to their you know, harm's, um, harm's way. And we're thankful for all those that do that. But there's other people on the front line too. Um, and I am gonna ask those of you who are in this category to stand, just so we kind of know. But if you are employed by the school district, would you stand up please? Don't be shy. If you're employed by a school district, anywhere, now, stay standing, don't sit down. If you are a teaching your kids at home as a part of the homeschool program, would you stand up? All right? Don't go anywhere. Now, if you're a student of any kind at all, would you stand up? Stay standing. We're going to pray for y'all. Lord, thank you so much for these teachers, these parents, these grandparents, these students. This is such an odd and, and changeable time that we live in. But I just pray for these dear ones that are on the front line. Students, teachers, parents, grandparents that are going through a time that is really unusual. Lord, give them your grace. Give them your power. Give them diligence as they work in an unfamiliar environment. Many times an undesirable environment. But what a good God you are to give us the strength we need to get through. And we want to praise you and thank you and ask tomorrow, as they step back in the saddle, that you'll give them your grace and diligence to do a good job. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. Y'all may be seated. I appreciate what you're doing. If you have your sermon notes handy, you can pull those out of your, your bulletin. We'll take a look at those as we work our way through. We're in Revelation chapter 11. Okay, so, so much for the encouraging words we're going to go back into the tribulation. <laughs> now, we, have, we, are, we are working our way through, and just a, a bit of a summary, the way that they had books in the Bible days is that they wouldn't have binding on the spine like we have today on a binding and it just took open to a particular page. They would have, they would write a little bit and then they would scroll it up or roll it up and they'd end up with a scroll, much like that. And just to keep it safe, it was, if it was to be private or if it was official, they would put a seal across that to, to keep it secure. And then as in the book of Revelation, where what's going to be happening in our future is already recorded for us, 
There was a scroll that was presented, and it had seven seals on it. Some people think that that could have been a seal across the upper edge. We broke a seal and then furled it a little bit, broke another seal, and then furled that a little bit. I'm not sure how that happened, but they, they, they did. There were seven seals we talked about in the first part of the book of Revelation. And we, as we came to the seventh seal that was broken, we found that embedded within that seventh seal were six trumpet judgments, where the trumpet would blow and some form of God's uh, judgment for sin would drop on the earth. And then as the second trumpet would blow, blow another form of God's judgment would, would drop on the earth. Not because God loves judging and punishing, but God loves saving. And that's why we're hearing this today. Because we're not there. And as we receive His grace, we're not destined for the tribulation. And even those within the tribulation, God promised that they'll just turn their hearts to Christ. He can walk with them through the most difficult of times. And many of those people were so persecuted, or will be so persecuted, that they will die for their faith. So I would encourage us all to consider our relationship with Christ now rather than then, if we make it that far. Within these trumpet judgments, there's a number of times and plagues and famines and release of demons on the earth. Where if you add up all the people that died, one half of the world's population will die. And any death is sad. Some of you, many of you, maybe most of you have lost loved ones. Sometimes they have been just because old age takes its toll. Sometimes we lose younger ones. In fact, I was talking to my granddaughters this past weekend, and it, we were talking about the fact that when older people die, yeah, it's sad, but when somebody younger dies, it's unexpected. But in the tribulation, half of the population of the world will die in a very short period of time. Now, we're wrapping up the trumpet judgments. This is the end of the sixth trumpet judgment. Uh, and in the seventh trumpet judgment will be embedded seven bold judgments. So it just kind of keeps telescoping out. But the title of the message today is the wrap up to the beginning of the end. Okay. Read that again. The beginning of the end. Well, next week will come the seventh trumpet. It contains the seven bowls. This is a wrap up to the sixth trumpet, the second woe that was predicted back in chapter eight. The, there was the first four trumpet judgments when they had massive global disasters, war and violence. Even your own pets will turn on you because of the demonic force on them. And then the rest after this, the angel cried out in Revelation 8, 13, woe, 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 predicted three more woes. We are, we are right now in that seventh woe, that second, I mean the second woe, uh, where the rest of the earth will suffer great persecution for their sin. These are the remaining trumpet judgments. Even during this period of time, people will be so miserable because of the pain and agony they're going through physically and emotionally. It's scripture says they will seek death and not find it. It will be so bad they will want to die, and yet they won't be able to. No matter how creative a person might be, the scripture says God will have this way. Then there will be massive war deaths, ravaging war across the globe. And now we finish today. Now, now we finish the second of these three remaining woes. Wrap up to the beginning of the end. So I'd like to read Revelation chapter 11. The first, you know what, we'll just read that as we work our way through. As we look at Revelation 11, uh, I work my way through, I look at this, then after I've kind of got my outline, got a sense of where I think we're going to go with this, I need to check with some of the commentators that are out there to see if they're right or not. <laughs> but if I always go first to the commentators, I let them influence me. And yes, I get insights, I get historical data, I think of something that I've never thought of before, and it's really helpful, but I always want to do my work in the text first, and then check with the commentators. And I was 
kind of excited about getting into chapter 11, yet every one of the commentators I read says, ah, this chapter 11 of Revelation, this is one of the most challenging, interpretive uh, parts of the entire book of Revelation. And I thought, hmm, maybe I missed something here. I thought that made kind of sense to me a little bit. So I went back and we read it, and these commentators oftentimes said there is some interpretive challenges here. And yes, there, there are. But I stand in awe of these theological giants. I don't make any grandiose claims that for me I can make the complicated simple. In fact, I've been known to make the very simple sound pretty complicated. But for me, I go back to the basics of interpretation we covered earlier in our series, that scripture as scripture interprets scripture itself, we'll see a literal perspective. For instance, Jesus and even Paul referred to Adam as a literal person, not a figure. Some teach that Adam was really wasn't a real human being, but he pictured what, how mankind kind of took their approach in, and this is theology stuff, how they took his approach to God and just kind of a figure of a mankind. But both Jesus and Paul say he wasn't just a figure, but he was a real human being, and he did exist, and he did live his life, and the scripture records what happened there. Some people think that Noah, on that big boat that floated across the, uh, the, the flood waters, think that he was just, a really, him and his boat were just a, a type or a figure of what judgment and salvation would look like. But he was referred to as a real, genuine person. In scripture. He, there are figures mentioned though, there are figures of speech, and we don't want to take everything literally to, to the most wooden aspect. Uh, Jesus in John 10 says, I am the door. Now that doesn't mean that he was a wooden slab sitting back and forth on hinges, but, the, but he literally is the passageway. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So yes, we'll see figures of speech or metaphors, but they have a literal application. John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming up over the hill down to the Jordan River to be, a, to be baptized, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now so Jesus wasn't a little woolly critter that comes up like, ah. But he really was that sacrificial element. That just like was shown in the, in the, in the First Testament's uh, theology, there was a sacrificial lamb that was literally sacrificed to deal with the sinfulness that separates mankind from God. In, in all of the First Covenant's practices, this sa sacrifice as it was given, the blood wouldn't cleanse their sin, it would cover their sin. And it was kind of like the bank account was being rolled ahead. But then when Jesus came, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus' blood completely wipes it out. And we're told in Scripture, He removes our sin from us as far as the West is from the East. Hence we see God has an eternal distinct plan for Israel, separate from His plan for the church, the bride of Christ. Therefore, unless we're told to, uh, it's obvious that if, uh, when there's a figure of speech or a metaphor, uh, unless there is that, I will just take the scripture literally for what it says. Now that helps me, in my simple mind, work my way through the passage. Now if you're taking notes, number one, there's kind of two things that take place here. It has to do with uh, the temple and some witnesses that show up. So number one, the measuring of the temple of God. The measuring of the temple of God. I'll just read the first two verses for us. Then, this is John speaking. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So we'll just come back and take that kind of a piece at a time. Letter A, the command to measure. So he was told, and by the way, what, how they would measure, when I measure something, now I get a tape measure up and I measure it along there really good. Brandon, you're a worker with cutting and stuff like that. How many times do you measure compared to how many times you cut? Well, you who measure once, cut once. But for me, it's measured two or three times. You, you ever made any mistakes? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> See, you've made so few mistakes, you can probably remember both of them. I made you three times. Nice. <laughs> I appreciate that. But here, how they would measure, they wouldn't have a tape measure. They would have a reed or a staff. And a staff could be anywhere between five or six feet long, seven or eight feet long. And there was a, they would use a standard measurement. They would say, well, how, how large is this town? Well, so many rods by so many rods. And they would be able to show them the rod that they used for measuring here. Now, very interesting. The purpose of measuring was not to find out how big it was so they could charge them the proper amount of property. But it really was to measure it out, to, to see what's my boundaries. If you measure out your, it's, it's like having a surveyor come out to your property. And they measure from this point to this point, and from this point to this point, and this point to this point. And we find out that they measured it out, and that demarks your ownership. What, what you're paying taxes on, what you're, what you're buying, that is yours. So the measuring, the purpose of measuring was to demark ownership or control or authority. And so in this passage, the purpose of measuring was to mark out what was God's. You don't mess with what was God's. The temple, uh, and he also said, measure, he said, measure the temple, rise measure the temple of God and the altar of God. There's that altar where the sacrifices were made. It was made very specific. Not only is the temple belong to God, but that which inside of it. Now, I, I need to back up. There's been a number of temples for the Jews over the period of time. The first one, Solomon built. And then that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then after, they, on their return, there was one that Zer Zerubbabel. Well, that's a mouthful. Zerubbabel had built a new temple for the Jews as they came back from captivity to worship there. And then that was destroyed. And then Herod, in Jesus' time, built another temple, and it was completed probably when Jesus was about six or seven years old. And then that was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and there hasn't been another one built since that time. So there have been three temples so far, and there's yet to be two more that we will find out in Scripture. This is one of them right here. Dur during the tribulation period, when Satan, through the Antichrist, had made this covenant with Israel, he said, man, if you'll just let me help you out here, I will. So they, they built it. They will build. I keep talking about the past tense because of the reading of the Bible. It listed in past tense, but this is still yet into our future. But they will build this new temple. <clears throat> the Jews will worship there. And then later on, we'll see what happens to that temple, and then there'll be a brand new one built at the end of the book. But as we work our way through, the, the, the command to measure the, the temple, the altar, and then measure the worshipers. God wants others to know that they belong to him. Now the Jews at this time still haven't recognized Christ as Messiah. They still haven't given their heart to, to Jesus to be the one whom God has sent to save us from our sins. But they're trying. They're, they're trying to worship God and say he's built this protection so that they might hear the gospel and have a chance to respond. Not all Jews are going to come to faith in Christ. But he wants to bring many to himself. Then he says, let her be a command not to measure. And he says basically in verse 2, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So the court outside. And during the first number of temples that were built, there was a court, an outer court, and it was called the court of the Gentiles. When Jesus came through the temple grounds one day, and they saw that they were buying and selling sheep and money traders were in there. And that was in the court of the Gentiles. And he got really angry at the Jews for doing this because they were using the court of the Gentiles as a way to jack up and scam people on the exchange price for you've got, got to use the temple money because it's, it's most holy, you know. And then once you've done that, you, you travel from a long way to worship at the temple. You, gotta, you wouldn't want to bring your animal all that way to sacrifice because it would probably get, die or be burdensome along the way. So you buy one there. We're so convenient, we'll provide everything for you. But they jacked the price way up. Jesus comes through there just mad or anything, saying, get out of here. You've made my house, a, my father's house, a, a den of robbers. And so he kicked them all out of the temple. 
because the court of the Gentiles wouldn't let any outsiders come in. It was just full of animals and a bunch of scammers. So Jesus was saying all of it. But here, in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, uh, John is told not to measure that outer court. It's already been overrun. It's already been overrun by those who would seek to do evil and not to worship God. Given over to the nations to trample it underfoot for 42 months. Now, this has been our first exposure to these kind of numbers in this chapter. We just heard about a length of time of 42 months. Now, and then we're about to hear of 1,260 days, just a little deeper in the text. If you take 30 days to a month, that equals 42 months if you take it and divide it by 1260, which all together makes about three and a half years. How about that? All the math matches up. 1260 days equals 42 months equals three and a half years. And that's during this whole time, those three different forms of measurement are going to be used in here. Number two in your notes, the messengers of the word of God, verses three through six. I want to, before we just, we won't read through all of that text there. We'll just go through, go through it a piece at a time. Letter A, these, these, these uh, witnesses that are there, their prophecy, letter A, their prophecy. First, I want to look at the clothing because that's really important that we catch an idea of what they're wearing. I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now sackcloth is a garb of mourning, especially mourning over sin. And when there was a, a time when Job in the Old Testament, it says that he was a righteous man. And whenever his children, his sons and his daughters got together for a big birthday party, he would put on a sackcloth and he would go and he would pray that in case they sinned, God would, that would heal them of that sin and not afflict them. And when he himself was in such misery, he would put on sackcloth then. So there's a time of mourning, but especially a time of mourning for sin. They wore sackcloth, not for their repentance, but they were calling their audience to repent. They denounced sin and they proclaimed Jesus. How popular would that be today on the streets of our town, in Olympia, in Washington, D.C., you have somebody going around and screaming out, repent or ruin, flip or fry, and you can put any other combination of things in there. Our culture doesn't like stuff like that. Oh, we'll like free speech, but if it has to do with God, they want to cut that off right away. But it says for 1,260 days, same thing as 42 months, these two witnesses, it says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy. Now the word prophesy, many times we associate that with predicting the future. It's foretelling. But really the word prophesy means to foretelling. You, you declare what God's word is, you project it forth, and that may include something predictive in the future, but basically it proclaims what is the word of God. And so when any time anyone takes God's word and they proclaim it, biblically speaking, that's prophecy. So here are these two witnesses. They're declaring God's word to a group of people during the tribulation who are desperate to hear from God, who need God. Letter A, the prophecy. Letter B, their personality. Let's take a look at these two right here. And in verse four, it says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. <laughs> these verses alone can cause many commentators to scratch their heads to where their hair falls out. Don't look up here when I say that. Some have proposed that possibly, maybe these are just symbolic of the Old Testament and the New Testament. As these, as they have 
the, the first covenant that God has made and the second covenant through Jesus Christ, put those together, you've got two witnesses. And so some people think these were real people. These were just symbolic of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some say they're, they're symbolic of the prophets and the apostles. Many, there's so many other suggestions. I've heard even someone say that maybe this is Walter, uh, Martha Walters and Walter Cronkite born again. <laughs> You can go all over the place and be crazy, but they're just literal two human beings, two men that will stand up and it says they will be, have been given authority by God to proclaim God's word, to speak against the sin of that time and to proclaim repentance. And their, their primary audience were Jewish people. I'm not going to go to the wall for this, but I, I think that I have a fairly good idea that one of those was Elijah. And it doesn't really matter if I'm right or not on this one, but I just want to play with this a little bit. In the Old Testament, he could call down fire on the altars of Baal. He could stop the rain as a part of God's judgment, maybe, and possibly the other one was Moses. He would execute plagues and turn water into blood, as we'll see that these two together... If you, if you go into the New Testament now, there was a time where Jesus was with three of his disciples in the Mount of Transfiguration. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter plainly saw that these three were talking, Jesus and the two other figures, and he recognized them to be Elijah and Moses. How did he recognize them? I have no idea. Maybe they had name tags. I don't know what it was. But somehow for the conversation, Peter could figure it out. It was Elijah and that it was Moses who were standing there talking. Together they were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Very interesting. Moses was stopped from getting into the promise. then because of his act of disobedience when they were wandering through the wilderness. And God said, because of your sin, amongst the people, you can see the promise then, but you can't get in there. And so he died and was buried up on the mountain uh, before they ever went in. Maybe the Mount of Transfiguration was his access to get in on that particular day. But now together, Elijah and Moses reappear and they're prophesying for God. Am I right? I think so. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it. It's not, a, it's not critical to the question. I just give you my take on that particular one. I really want to focus on uh, letter C, their protection. They're prophesying. They're speaking God's word. They are holding back nothing. And as they do, not everybody is, is coming by and putting a little bit of money in their offering box. In fact, it says in verse 5, And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Let us see their protection. So these guys are standing on the street corner somewhere in Jerusalem. No one can stop them or shut them up or do anything about it. But someone tries to stop them. Hey, you don't have a permit to have a gathering here on the street side. They would keep proclaiming the God. When someone tries to stop them or do them harm or issue a mandate that you can't do that, the text says fire would pour from their mouth. Poof! And there goes the, there goes the competition. If anyone plans or tries to stop them or harm them or harass them, God has a way of taking care of that. And he will give these two authority to do it that way. Poof. Letter D, their power. In verse 6, it goes just beyond the fire coming out of their mouth to stop their adversaries. In addition, verse 6 says, they have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and that they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood, and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Strike the earth. We're not just talking about a street corner in Jerusalem. We're talking about a global situation. Right now, some of you who are doing school online, what, what are they using? Zoom or Google Meet or something like that? I'm about as high tech as a cricket, so I'm not really, in fact, I think crickets are a little better than I am. 
my granddaughters were talking to me, you guys know more, more about technology than I'll ever know. And they, they're using, <laughs> Lizzie agreed, and they're, they're using this language where LOL and all those kind of things. And they can talk this language and I don't have a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> and then they're both learning sign language in school and I still can't figure that out. Only thing I know is, okay, what's that mean? What's that? I didn't say it. What does it mean? Why don't you go like that? Okay, like that. Like, like that? That's on the salute and the military, but in sign language, it's high. So, or low, or, or whatever. But see, I still didn't get it right, and they've been trying to teach me on that. Why in the world would they go down that road? <laughs> anyway, these, these two witnesses are proclaiming the Word of God in language that is to be clear to the people. But as often as they want. And so it says here they have the power to shut the sky. It doesn't say that they immediately did it, but they, okay, I know where I was going, technology. Global, people are watching. There's cameras, I'm sure, will be set up in the, in the square in Jerusalem saying, hey, this is so and so coming to you live from the temple square in uh, Jerusalem. And they're going to give you a report, and we'll all be able to see it, whether it's CNN or Fox or or other news sources you have, or on your phone, or your computer, or whatever, you'll be able to see what's going on globally around there. But we won't be here. That's right. Uh, we will have been raptured out as the church, so people will be able to see what's going on there. They'll have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. So it's a good chance that it didn't rain for or won't rain for three and a half years. This little rain we had recently, to me, I thought was really refreshing. Just before that, we had some rain that kind of washed the uh, the smoke out of our sky. It's always refreshing. Three and a half years, not one drop of rain. The sky was shut. Or will be shut. That wreaks havoc on our rivers and on our our. Uh, water source. Talk about climate change, my goodness. But they also had the power to turn water into blood. So, no problem, I got a whole bunch of water stored up, I got a whole bunch of at Costco, at Costco used to have water, stored it up in my garage, I probably got 60 gallons of water in these little water bottles, and okay, no, I, I don't really have this, I'm just saying this is what people could say. Because there's this water shortage, you had rain for three and a half years. They go out to get a water bottle out of the container, and it says here, they have the power to turn water into blood. I don't think they got fruit juice, and they'll all be red in there. That'll make it difficult to live. And then it says, on top of all of that, they will strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So it's not like we just have one pandemic of coronavirus running around. They can pile stuff on top and on top. And all of this is for the purpose of judging sin and yet still wooing people. Repent. Repent. There's still time to repent and turn from our wicked ways. Strike the earth with every kind of plague. Three and a half years. Now, we know that. But many of them are not going to sit there and read the Bible as they watch this unfold because they don't even care about God. They don't even believe in the Bible. So they don't know that after three and a half years this is all going to wind up and be different. It's just misery after misery after misery, day after day after day after day. We know that some people do repent during this period of time. But other people just throw their nose at God and keep going in wicked ways. Number three in your notes. The massacre of the servants of God. If you want to know how to spell massacre, that's M-A-S-S, -S, period. <laughs> now it's very interesting here in verse 7, it's, it changes tense. It changes to past tense. And none of the commentators could tell me why. I can't figure out why. But it's almost like we're watched ahead and we're able to look back on this now as though it was past tense. Verse 7, And when they had finished their testimony, 
The beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Letter A, their demise. Their demise. The key phrase here is when they had finished their testimony. For three and a half years now, they look back on their calendar. These guys have been standing up day in and day out, proclaiming God's word, denouncing sin, calling people to faith in Christ, proclaiming righteousness, talking uh, uh, in condemnation against the sinful practices that have been going on. Won't these guys ever shut up? And the news is all you hear about them on the news. But when they had finished their testimony, now catch this, no one is vulnerable to death for serving the Lord until God says they're finished. Now that's from the divine side. From the human side, yes, I'm going to be careful. I, I want to do God's work. I want to do God's work God's way. I still take vitamin C and vitamin D. I don't know, I don't know how to tie the sovereignty of God and the free will of man together. Which one is true? The answer is yes. And so here, they, they worked for God. They didn't hold anything back. They proclaimed his word. But it says, when they had finished their testimony. These two witnesses had, test, had testified and proclaimed the gospel to the Jews for three and a half years in the streets of Jerusalem. They did not sin. They put down their adversaries with fire. <sighs> Talk about bad breath. They, they, they pronounced plagues of drought and sickness and judgment on the rampant uh, sin for three and a half years. They didn't know the timetable, but God's timing is perfect. And for three and a half years, Satan's tempter had, temper had been boiling and boiling and boiling. He had done some damage to the world, but these two are a big thorn in his flesh, like a rock in his shoe. He, the Antichrist, and all his minions could not stop or interfere until God's timing was complete. Then with all of their hatred and their bile, they had uh, they and the beast of the bottomless pit rose up and vented the venom from hell on these two, and they conquered those two. Finally, they overcame them and they killed them. And all the power that these two witnesses had at first. Now they were ineffective and their corpses lay dead on the street. Did they lose? No. <laughs> no, they didn't. God's plan was fulfilled. But that was their temporary demise. And just as we're going to see in a moment, there'll be a little bit of a change to that. But I want to go to the point that Many times when we stand at the graveside for someone who's passed, I've heard it said before, and we commit their body to its final resting place. No. That's a temporary resting place. Because we know the believers are going to be resurrected uh, and go to heaven in the rapture. And we know that later on at the end of the book of Revelation, even though people that have turned their heart against God will be resurrected and sent into judgment as well. So that grave is only a temporary holding place. But there they lay, dead on the streets of Jerusalem. Letter B, it gets worse. It goes to their defilement. Something that desecrates them. Something that is made to dishonor them. Middle Eastern culture is that you bury someone within 24 hours of death. And instead, the masses let them, in fact, they made them lay. They would not let them be buried, but make their... Their dead bodies lay in the hot sun of the streets of Jerusalem. And they didn't know necessarily how long we're just going to keep them there to prove to everybody they're dead. And it was a way of desecrating them. It was a, it was a defilement. Killing them wasn't bad enough. Let them rot right there. We'll watch them rot. These scoundrels that had caused us such great misery. Very interesting. These are such holy, righteous Jews. In Deuteronomy 21, there's a command. Uh, it, it talks primarily about someone who's been hung on a tree, but it refers to anyone who has died, even a criminal or a righteous person. And if any man has committed a crime, 
punishable by death, and he is to be put to death. You hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a man hanged on a tree is cursed by God. You shall not defile the nation, or you shall not defile the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. So even if it brings defilement on the land, the disgust and hatred that Satan has spread makes this look like a good thing. We're going to let those bodies lay up there as an example. Anybody start speaking for God, that's what your demise is going to be like. So they wanted to send this message. And, and even if it brought them a curse from God, evil will be so elated with the death of these two tormentors of sin that they don't even deserve the honor of burial. Their defilement was paramount. Killing them was not good enough. Let their bodies rot in the hot, dry heat of the streets of Jerusalem. And there they sat. No, there they lay. And people were rejoicing. Oh, but letter C is coming. Their, speaking of these two servants now, their day of, of glee. And this isn't glee that they're going to have. This is the glee or the joy of those that watched them die. In verse 10. The people, okay, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because of these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. The people are so elated that these tormentors are finally out of the way. Day after day, they spoke against the lifestyle of the people there. They made everybody so mad because of their, these two witnesses were right and no one could stop them. But now, they're gone. No more fire breathing, no more plague. By those two, they, they poisoned our water, they torment. Let's have a party. Can you imagine the scene? Party, gift giving. They, they said, hey, come over, we're going to have a party, we're going to have a gift. And they said, yeah, we brought one for you too. We're celebrating the death of these two buzzards. That's kind of the, the setting that it's going to look like right there. Sinners will be so gleeful that they're going to go out of their way to celebrate. Sin always celebrates when evil triumphs. Just turn on your, no, don't turn on your television. Take my word for it. It's nasty stuff when people celebrate the wrong. Right is pronounced as wrong, and wrong is celebrated as good. And there they are. Now, this would be bad news if I stopped right here. But there's one more to go. Number four, the miracle of the power of God, verses 11 to 13. Can you imagine the news cameras on the scene? And now we'll see breaking news from Jerusalem. I'll just read the text, verse 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. And they <gasps> stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Letter A, their resurrection. I love it when bad news is followed by that contrasting conjunction, but. Well, you have a very bad disease, I hate to tell you. It says the doctor, and this has got some horrible symptoms, but we found a new treatment that will be inexpensive, very effective, and leave you with no side effects. Give me the medicine right now. So, bad news, but good news. That's what's happening here. But, verse 11, after three and a half days, a breath of life from God <clears throat> comes in. I'll bet you Wolf Blitzer and Jim Acosta will drop their microphones when they down. <laughs> not making a judgment call, I'm assuming they'll be standing there and not in the rapture. So <laughs> forgive me, Lord, for saying that. I shouldn't have done it. But just imagine, for three and a half days, their dead bodies were lying on the streets of Jerusalem. These hot days in the sun, just lying there. Yep. They were dead. There's no doubt about it at all. Then one afternoon, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, 
And a great fear fell on those who saw them. Well, duh. Imagine, if you're celebrating a big party over these tormentors being dead, and their rotting bodies are on the street out there, and then they stand up and they start breathing, great fear would fall too. The entire earth, which once was celebrating their death, now witnessed their resurrection. Party time is done. There they are. Standing up from where they once lay, breathing from where they once were decomposing, living where once they were dead, and by the power of God, the one who grants life. Anyone touched by the power of God will never really die. I remember Jesus said at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That doesn't mean that your pulse will never stop. That doesn't mean that they will never, you'll never be embalmed or cremated. But it means who you are as a person will never die. Your tent may die, but you won't. And later on, God's going to give you a brand new tent anyway. I wonder if I'll have more hair. I don't know. That's going to be determined on that one. <laughs> Can't get much less. But Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And you're never really going to die. Yes, you're, you're going to be pronounced dead by the medical profession. But there's that part of you that will continue to live on. So their resurrection. Let her be their rapture. Verse 12. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. <laughs> I'm glad I'm going to be out of here in the rapture. But it would really be cool to stand there and watch this happen. Stand right up, you know, stand behind the wall or the or something like that, see what's going on. Uh, and when these two are taken up into heaven. Now, very interesting. Most of our English translations will say in a cloud, but the Greek is very specific and it says the cloud, te nephele. And this was not just an ordinary cloud, this was the cloud. When the Jews were led by the Lord in the wilderness, they followed a cloud by day and a pillar by fire at night. When God inhabited the temple, uh, with his holy presence, or even the tabernacle before that, a cloud des descended upon it, representing the Shekinah glory of God. Now these dear faithful saints were called home, and they got to go to heaven in the cloud. Let us see. This is where we're going to wrap this part up here. Their retribution. You can put the word revenge if you don't like retribution in there. Verse 13. And at that hour, okay, these guys are gone. They're up into heaven. Everything, they're there. And the earth is still kind of reeling from what has been happening over the past three and a half days. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, I'm going to go back to that word great <laughs> earthquake. It, it, the Greek word is mega. You know, I like stuff like Mega Oreo, <laughs> Mega Chocolate Cake. You know, the word Mega like that is a good thing. But Mega Earthquake? No, I don't think so. U.S. Geological Society said that between us, uh, the, uh, they classify a Mega Earthquake as anything between 7.0 and 10.0. Each time an earthquake occurs, <laughs> And it increases, uh, it, it will increase by a factor of 10. Okay, here's the illustration. In other words, when there's an earthquake of 7.1 magnitude on the Richter scale, if it goes up to 7.2, it's twice as powerful. Now just think about that. So if it goes from 7.0 to 7 to 8.0, that's a magnitude of 10 larger. So it, it really increases exponentially the larger it gets. This one in Jerusalem, and the tribulation will be a mega quake. 
I had no idea. No one's even predicted what it could look like. But we do know that a uh, uh, that one tenth of the entire town will be leveled. Mass destruction, loss of property and of life. The, the life here is the loss of life here is astounding. There have been a large losses of life in other places, but this is particularly compelling because the Greek reading led some insight that we missed a little bit in the English. The literal rendering is men of name or men of renown. These are going to be not just ordinary people like you and me. We're just ordinary people, but these are important people. These are people of wealth, people of political, or people of powerful influence. Men of renown, men of name. You mentioned some of these names globally that people would know about, and they would know globally. Maybe there was a conference that they were attending there in Jerusalem. I don't know what to do. Maybe they were given box seats on the side of the streets to watch these guys rock on the streets that have been causing everybody problems. I don't have any idea what was going on, but I do know that 7,000 of these people will die in this massive, great earthquake that is there. They will be notable people that the world will soon miss. Could be that they're having some conference, possibly. Don't mess with God's plan. It doesn't matter what political party you belong to, how much money you got, what your education is. Don't mess with God's plan. Follow His word. He gives it clearly to us in Scripture. In fact, we read a few weeks ago, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed, you are to do for you, and you, they're for you and your sons, that you might do all that is according to the law. And that's what God wants us. You can't figure all of the book of Revelation out. We know enough, at least to know that I need to be saved, be sanctified, and be sharing my faith with other people. Don't mess with God's plan. You are never as secure anywhere as you are when you are in the center of his will. Look at verse 14. The second woe is past. Behold, the third is soon to come. Ah, oh, it's sort of like, are we done yet? Some of you students have probably said, school almost finished for the day. No, honey, it's only 10.30 in the morning. You've been on since 10. Oh, but here, the tribulation that ravages the earth, it's all because of sin. People have been thumbing their nose at God for, for millennia. Enough is enough. He draws a line in the sand. He says, I told you this was coming, and it is. And he wants to relieve those who would come to him by faith. So we look at our taken home section. We're going to wrap this up. At your taken home section down there, it's got review and preview. Under review, I want to leave this to you. And this is where I want to get interactive. So please don't climb up on me now, okay? Review. How would you summarize what we have just heard this morning and how that should apply to our life? How would you summarize it? How would you review it? Better get ready because bad days are coming. Okay. <laughs> Better get ready because bad days are coming. That, that's good. What else? Humanly speaking, you said whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, yeah. There's three walls. We're going down to two now. Somebody else said something. You haven't seen anything yet. Oh, man. You haven't seen anything yet. Or to the, do it like a redneck, you ain't seen nothing yet, baby. <laughs> all part of the plan. And that is so true. It's all part of the plan. We can see that looking at it from this side. They just need to get it. Last chance. Some of you are saying good. Don't bad. wait. What's that? Don't wait. Don't wait. Okay, everything you've heard, some one of these people here, write one of those things down and read. That's, they're all true. They're all accurate. They're all, it's all right in there. So under preview, you can do one of two things. You've got an option. You can either finish reading the book, I mean the chapter of, uh, 11 chapter of Revelation, or let me encourage you to, to read the entire book of Jude every day. Let me say, the entire book? People, it's only one chapter and it's a short chapter. 
If I said to turn to Jude chapter 2, verse 4, you'd never find it. It's a small chapter. It's the second to the last book in the Bible. It's just before Revelation. But read that book because it speaks so much to this time that we just talked about today. And that kind of prepares, helps prepare us for how I should prepare on earth for what's coming next. There's still one more woe left to go. I did not mean to rhyme this time. I better stop <laughs> before you all decide to hop. No, I'm not trying to rap. I was trying to take a nap. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, Father, you're so good to give us this ahead of time. You're so good to teach us what will come for those people who choose not to submit their hearts to Jesus. Father, I pray that you'll help each of us to take inventory of our, of our own heart. Am I really in a position to where I know Jesus is my Savior? Have I asked him to come in to know my heart? Father, help us to make a clear evaluation in our own heart. And then, Father, help us to know what areas of our life need to be submitted to you that maybe I'm still hanging on to. Help me, God, to know where I need to be surrendered. And then, Father, help me to share this week. Help me to, to find one soul, one person to say something about Jesus so they might have a little bit of light that they can see before this awful calamity strikes the earth. What a good God you are to give it to us in advance. And we want to praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us, please? Thank you. 